Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Eric Eckstein. Um, I'm working with Alberto Pereira and Paul Weaver, and I'll be here talking about thermally driven morphine with hybrid laminates and metal matrix composites. And uh, the title isn't quite accurate because we're actually also just getting into ceramic matrix composites as well. But if you want to learn more about that, come talk to me because it hasn't quite been published yet. Um, so the basic premise of my work is to get things to move when they change temperature. So think fancy bimetal strips. The trick is that you first start with a low expansion composite. Uh, carbon fiber, silicon carbide fibers are popular because they're stiff, low thermal expansion coefficient. And laminate on top of that, a high expansion metal. Really, most metals work pretty darn well, but stainless steel and aluminum um, are particularly good. And the basic idea, of course, is that one expands more than the other upon temperature change, and you develop a thermal moment primarily along the fiber direction. So here we've built a, an example of this. Um, this particular laminate is carbon epoxy on the top layer and an aluminum alloy on the bottom layer. And this bends quite a lot just to, upon cooling off. We've just opened up the oven door here and taken a few pictures. The applications we're looking at for this sort of technique is in passive aerodynamic control. So Boeing, for example, has been working on making these little chevrons impinge on the fan exhaust flow in order to reduce noise. They only want to do that near the ground. Otherwise, it costs them drag at cruise. So they want to be able to move these chevrons in and out. They're trying to do that with SMAs. We think we can do that with nothing more than aluminum and carbon fiber. Now, if you start with a flat plate, you get an initially linear temperature displacement response. However, it doesn't have to be that way. We can mimic SMA properties by playing a few tricks with the geometry. Our materials are still roughly linear in their response in terms of how much thermal strain they develop per temperature. But we can appeal to geometric nonlinearity. And here's a, a quick example of a nonlinear geometric structure. Uh, it's just the old carpenter's tape measure. You have something whose stiffness is dependent upon its displacement. So when it's nice and straight here, it has a nice deep beam section, relatively stiff. We apply a little bit of moment to it here it's with my fingers, but in my research, it's with internal thermal moments. And we lose a little bit of transverse curvature. So essentially, this beam is flattening out. It becomes less stiff. And eventually, the rate of stiffness loss exceeds the rate at which the moment is being applied, and snap through occurs. That's basically all it is. I'm sure we've all experienced this on an everyday basis. Here we are. We're putting it to good work. Um, so now we've done an experiment, and we've made a carbon aluminum plate with initial curvature, initially curved, just like this tape measure. I've stuck it in an oven here. And I've got all these little spots on it, so I can keep track of its displacements with 3D digital image correlation. We've got some cameras looking at it here, and we also can measure the temperature using some thermal couples. And the results of this are presented here. So this is curvatures plotted against temperature. The curves on the bottom here are the 90 degree curvatures, so 90 degrees to the fibers, that is. And the curves on the top are the zero degree curvatures. In general, we're concerned with the zero degree curvatures because this is the direction at which your thermal moments are maximized along. It's, it's essentially the actuation direction that you'd be concerned with most likely as an engineer. And this plot is best read from right to left. So starting over here on the right, that's when we have zero thermal stress, or at least approximately zero. And then as we cool off, the thermal stress builds up. And eventually, we have snap through. This is essentially the snapping of the tape measure. And then as we heat up again, snap through occurs again, but not at the same temperature. And this is not material hysteresis. There's no plastic deformation going on here. This is a geometric hysteresis. It's the same physics that analog thermostats rely on to avoid chattering upon temperature change. And potentially, that's useful in any temperature sensitive situation. So you don't have your chevron flaps flapping in and out as you're trying to climb up through the lower temperatures of the atmosphere. And here's a gratuitous video, because we all like this kind of thing. Here's just some infrared lamp heating up a plate. And there it goes. That's the snap through. This is a relatively thin plate, but you can actually make them quite thick. Um, what we find is that the stiffness of the plate, not surprisingly, scales with the cube of the thickness. The displacement scales with just the inverse proportional of thickness. So if you double the thickness, you actually get four times the point force at the, end of, uh, at the end of the actuator, for example, despite the fact that you only have half the displacement. So going thicker is generally better up to a point, as long as you're not too concerned about weight, of course. Now, that was with carbon epoxy and aluminum. That's only good to about 180 degrees if you're brave. But I think the real meaty part of this problem is to find actuators that work at even higher temperatures. We're talking 500 degrees and up, where normal actuators, like hydraulics and servo electronics, dare not go. So we're talking about going into the hotter parts of the gas turbine engine, where right now engineers would like to have variable geometry, but they just can't quite do it. So our first step along this process has been to manufacture metal matrix composites. And we're using the fiber basically as a restriction on thermal expansion coefficient. So we've created a laminate that is essentially a biased fiber volume fraction. So the manufacturing of this is actually kind of straightforward by uh, MMC standards. It uses the old classic fiber foil method where we start with layers of fiber and titanium foil. The fiber is a silicon carbide fiber. Hot press it at about 900 degrees Celsius for about an hour or so. And then the fibers more or less stay right where they should be. It's, it's a very neat and uh, orderly process when you kind of think about the, uh, the comparison that it could be in carbon epoxy. 
Uh, this is actually a micrograph of the cross section. This is three millimeters thick thereabouts, so these are some big fibers. Um, we're talking, you know, 140 micron fibers here, big boys. And these are the results we get. So we've made a little beam out of this MMC, stuck it inside a furnace, and now I've got a little uh, optical displacement measuring system that looks through the top of the furnace, and we can track displacements. We've only gone up to about 500 degrees for now because I want to make sure I can use these samples over later on, although in theory they should be good at least up to about 900. And the reason why I believe that actually is because if we extrapolate this curve here, this is curvature, extrapolate it all the way up to 900 degrees, it crosses right through zero curvature, which is right what the laminate started at. In other words, I believe the curvature should be recoverable, at least under no load. We'll see what happens when we start putting load on it. Now the next step after metal matrix composites is the ceramics. We think we can get these to achieve thermal actuation at temperatures of about 1,000 degrees or more if we're lucky. We're using in-house manufactured CMCs. In fact, some of our first successfully manufactured CMCs just came out of the furnace about a month ago. Um, I can show you some of those if you like. And we're going to braze these CMCs to a nickel super alloy. Um, you can also use stainless steel, but the, the creep becomes a limitation, so we like to use nickel super alloys, of course. The CMCs themselves are actually quite, I don't really want to call them flexible, but as long as you build them thin enough, they can actually take quite a bit of deflection before failure. Uh, this is one of the more recently manufactured CMCs on a three-point bend, and you wouldn't expect that to uh, come out of something that's uh, made out of ceramic, but it works. And uh, the trick, as it turns out, is to get good fiber pull-out properties here. So here we have uh, carbon fibers being partially pulled out of the silicon carbide matrix. As it turns out, that's critical. If you don't get fiber pull-out, it behaves like a brittle ceramic, and it's no fun. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them now or later at my poster.